Okay. It's probably a Sunday or a Saturday because that's when everyone is off from school and it takes a while to get to the mall. And you've traveled to the mall from all over the county, maybe even all over the state. You're arriving at a prearranged area, probably in the food court, and you know people are coming, but you're not positive who really, really is coming. You have no idea if they're going to arrive, and you don't know how many people are ultimately going to show up or what's going to happen next. You're coming here not because of some mandate or because it's your job. You're here because you have this one shared aspect with all these people. You all use the same BBS. This is Jason Scott. You're listening to the Jason Scott Talks His Way Out of It podcast, a podcast about technology, stories, and debt. Thanks to Jeff Atwood, Dan Boyd, and the hundreds of others who have come together through my Patreon to make this podcast possible and help me work my way out of all sorts of strange bills I've acquired over the years. So one of the reasons I fell backwards into becoming a historian of bulletin board system history and really of all technology history was a concern that there were all of these human experiences that would fall between the cracks. Of course, when something major happens anywhere, people write about it. But there's a lot of mundane things that represent the real day-to-day -day experience of people at different periods of time that will disappear because they don't have any reason to be part of written history. In modern history, you might think of it along the way of losing your signal to a cell tower when you go over a hill. You know, that's something that everybody experiences right now, but there's not a lot of incentive to write the all-knowing, all-meaning opus about the context of such a situation. And as soon as we fix it, however we do it, it's going to be something that just disappears. And earlier eras with home computers are full of these, all sorts of interesting little pieces that are going to, you know, really just go away. The experience of pulling the punched hole sides of a piece of paper that's gone through a form-fed printer, having a parent or a sibling pick up the phone when you're connected online and absolutely ruining your experience, the way that people would make an extra hole on a floppy disk drive to be able to double the capacity on a single-sided floppy disk, absolutely in violation of the manufacturing standards. All of this is in danger of disappearing unless somebody talks about it. And I'm sure I'll mine things going forward. But now I want to talk about BBS meets. You know, when I was doing the BBS documentary, this was one of those things that came out from a lot of discussions. And it was that bulletin board systems, for all of their fascination and the way that they seemed like you were doing something unlike anyone else in your area, uh, they were lacking something. They were lacking the human experience. I'm talking about the human experience where you are sitting across from someone and, and that person is making noise and, and has expressions on their face and you don't see or feel that when a person writes a message online. So it was natural that a bulletin board system, especially because it was a local experience, would eventually have somebody say, hey, I'm going out bowling on Tuesday or I'll be at the mall on Saturday. Anybody else from the board want to show up? And initially, it might be a once a month thing. You know, maybe the sysop wants to meet some of their users. So they would say, come on down to the whatever mall or come on over to my house and I'll have all of you over and we'll have lemonade and we'll talk about stuff and maybe trade software and let's have a good time. Let's have a party. Let's experience something around this. Other bulletin board systems, especially if they had a large and raucous group, would have regular meetings a few times a month, maybe every Wednesday, maybe every other Wednesday, maybe on the Saturdays or the Sundays. But it would have that schedule and dependency and the messages on the board would reflect this. You know, a person would say, well, bring it to the next meeting and I'll copy it from you or, hey, we'll trade next meeting and I'll get it back to you the meeting after that. You know, the meeting became this offline experience that was completely connected to the full experience of the bulletin board system. 
I was lucky enough to go to multiple great meetings associated with multiple bulletin boards. They all had a different flavor and a different flair. I think that's something in some ways that we've really lost. I mean, unquestionably, there's something magical about a cell phone and having it be aware of your location and being able to transfer a large amount of data in between people and even doing live video and sound. And the problem is that we hit an uncanny valley of that's just enough like meeting somebody that for a lot of people, they think that is meeting somebody. And it's not. It's, it's absolutely a different experience. When I was part of bulletin board system culture in the 80s, I was a teenager. This meant I couldn't drive. It also meant that I had a parent who would wonder where I was going all night. And of course, they would meet people from the bulletin board system and, and they would become trusted friends. And it wouldn't be a big deal when I would say, oh, I'm going to see Dan. I'm going to see Seth. I'm going to go see Tom because he would have met Dan and Seth and Tom. Dan could drive. Tom might not drive. But all of them at some point might stop over at a time different than a meeting. So there was some layer of protection and awareness between what I was doing and who I was doing it with. Now, we were no doubt getting up to no good and screwing around. But I, I look back and a lot of it is mostly harmless and, 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 and fundamentally a part of just being a teenager. In the case of the Ohio Scientific Users of New York Bolton Board System, also known as OSINI, this was a board that was created for a Ohio scientific users group, but it was quickly taken over by hackers and phone freaks to the point that there weren't many Ohio scientific users, frankly, but it was still called OSINI, and it still acted like that was what it was for. But hidden along it in little rooms and little nooks and crannies were all sorts of shenanigans involving phone freaking and hacking. And this group would meet. And we would primarily meet at a mall in White Plains, which was quite a trip for me. But I do remember being at that mall at the roughly appointed time and waiting for your friends to come around the corner. Now with Twitter and with texting, you get the whole story beforehand. You know your friend is out in the parking lot and making their way in. You know that they're going to check in at a local store before coming to you. You know where everything is all the time. But then it was a mystery. It was a weird hope that a friend would actually show up. And there was a rush of delight as you actually saw them. It was all saved up. I don't think we have that anymore. And if you were lucky, your friend was bringing along some sort of duffel bag or box, and in that were floppy disks or a lineman's handset or some other piece of computer or scientific equipment that you wanted to share with others in person. Now, this is all very different from user groups. I'll go into user groups at some point in the future, I'm sure. But user groups are very formalized things. They would almost always be monthly. They would have a agenda. You would get your agenda ready. People would come up with what was going on. These are still going on, uh, but they've been going back to the 60s and even the 50s. Uh, people would come with electronics or speeches or presentations, and they would give them to the group. So in many ways, it was a formalized, almost work-like environment. You know, contrast that with just a bunch of kids getting pizza at the pizza place. You know, lacking the agenda, lacking the planned set-up schedule, each particular meeting was a free-for-all. We might have something that had happened on the bulletin board system that everyone wanted to discuss, or we might want to build some sort of thing together. But primarily, it was just a bunch of people checking in with each other. And for some of these situations, I was going to these meetings for years. Um, it was something that was a vital part of the online experience, and it traversed up into the internet world. 
The Osini meetings went on for years. I mean, Osini lasted a very long time before it went under. And after Osini, I started a bulletin board system called The Works BBS. And The Works BBS was transferred from me to another young person named Dave, who took it over and moved it to Boston, where I also lived for many years. And the Works BBS would have Works meetings. And Works meetings were held in Harvard Square and would go either at the Au Bon Pain or go to Aventura Pizza. And again, it was just kind of a random conflagration of whoever happened to be in town or whoever had the time to show up. And parallel to bulletin board system meetings were 2600 meetings related to the Hacker Magazine that was founded in 1984 from the ashes of Tap Magazine, which also had meetings which were held in a diner in New York City. 2600 had their meetings in the Citibank building, and I was lucky enough to go to one of those around 1985 with a very young Emmanuel Goldstein and a bunch of other crazy kids. And, and even then, we had a lot of fun hanging out in this food court area and talking about whatever was on our minds related to either hacking or freaking or bulletin board systems or technology. In my particular case, I didn't learn how to drive until I was 27. So if I went to a meetup you know it mattered to me because I was usually going to have to get a lift from somebody. But it was worth it to me to get to a place to meet these people who I otherwise would only know online. There's all sorts of things that could be discussed, and there's all sorts of software that could be traded, but nothing was better than having a new person there, someone who had been on the bulletin board system and had worked themselves up slowly to come to this meeting. I mean, for me, it was social and interesting and fun. But for others, it was a kind of weird, uncomfortable experience to actually have to go out and meet others. I mean, they knew they wanted to, and we all wanted to be there. It wasn't required. But it's a different kind of person who uses computers obsessively, who then finds that really to get the full experience of the bulletin board, to get the inside jokes, to get the references, to get the nicknames, they're going to have to come to the meetup. So a new person would show up and we just drill them for questions, find out what they were up to, what they were doing, what they were into, what they were getting done what they liked about the bulletin board system, what they wanted to improve about it. You know, we learned about each other's lives on a fundamental basis. And from that, friendships grew. I mean, you'd meet people at the BBS meet, and then they'd kind of come over to your house, or you two would go out to eat, or there'd be a movie and you'd invite people. You know, uh, a lot of old bulletin board system messages. Sometimes you can't actually work out what's being discussed because it's only half of the discussion. It's a completion of something that was started at a meet or something that started on the bulletin board and then everyone acts like it was all finished because of the meet. There's this mirror world where you kind of build up an image of a bulletin board system in your mind when you dial into it. And that image is almost entirely fantastical. There's nothing about it that's based in reality. I mean, all you're getting from a computer is a stream of text. And from that, you're supposed to infer what is on the other side of the line. And I don't know, for me, it was always this image of this weird science fiction-y computer that had boxes and smoke and, and had somebody running among it. And it was in some weird little area. And it was just this vision of a computer world that I was calling in with my modem. And obviously, when you actually meet a bulletin board system, you discover that it's just a machine sitting on a desk or under a desk or next to a desk, and it's got a couple disk drives, and it blinks a little bit. And if the sysop hasn't been completely terribly bored of it, uh, the ringer still works, or they've turned off the ringer and the computer just every once in a while livens up. A person who runs a bulletin board system in the 1980s is several kinds of weird. Uh, 
They have the money and the means for an extra phone line and to dedicate a computer. They're, they like to reach out to people. They might be a natural born leader or kind of a leader or tolerates folks around them enough that they want to invite them into their house. But they also have all sorts of strange ideas about how things should be run and, and how people should behave. And, and they're in this combination of best friend, cop, janitor, wizard, invisible hand, not so invisible hand, tyrant. You know, it's all kind of wrapped into this one singular person. And so they would open up their home to all of these people who were visiting. And there wouldn't be any guarantee that the people who came weren't insane, dangerous oddballs. I mean, it was always floating there. But there is one party that I remember so vividly, and I'd like to tell you about it. So I was a co-sysop on a bulletin board system. A co-sysop was generally somebody who either did stuff the sysop didn't want to have to deal with, or there was some sort of weird honorific that was given to the buddies of the sysop. In my particular case, I had acquired a voice mailbox, and I had gotten this voice mailbox because I was tipped off that if you called this number and you chose a random extension and you typed in this default password, you might get a voice mailbox for free. And you were basically taking it from somebody who wasn't using it, but they might never use it, so who cares? And so I took over a voice mailbox and I told everybody about it on various bulletin board systems. And on one particular bulletin board system, some of them were impressed enough that they made me a co op and that was the restaurant at the end of the universe. And that was a bulletin board system that was run by the Outland. He had several names. And the Outland lived in Princeton, New Jersey. I lived in Chappaqua, New York. And the guy who ran it, uh, the Outland, had his own style. He had a lot of fun things to write. And he was a member of a group called the Neon Knights, Metal Communications. And the Neon Knights would write crazy text files about destruction and mayhem and causing trouble. And he wrote some of the weirdest ones. Um, he, you know, a, a typical one might describe uh, knocking on someone's door because you claimed your car was broken and you need to make a phone call. And when you go in, whip out your golf club and just start teeing off in their living room. Yeah, I don't know. It was really strange stuff to read. And I figured the Outland was a crazy guy who just looked insane. And, and I, I, I thought it would be really cool to meet him. So when the Outland announced that there was going to be an actual BBS party at his house, I jumped at the chance. I begged my father to drive me down to Princeton, and, and God bless him, he did. He loaded his son into a car, took him down to a place, and let him stay there for the day. Now, here's the thing. The Outland, who was named Jim, was the most conservative, quiet, pleasant guy you could ever want to meet. He was six foot three. He was as gentle as a lamb. He had a big, happy smile. He had wonderful eyes that were just portals of friendliness. And he just turned out to be somebody who looked completely normal and was just full of weird ideas. He loved punk. That was where I first heard the Dead Milkman. He played it for me, and I just was blown away that this was real music. His parents were a delight. They brought down drinks for us. And the group of people who assembled it, well, they were all kinds of kids, including the Blade and the Metallion, who were also members of the Neon Knights. Now, these kids were more of what I expected. Jean jackets, punk t-shirts, weird haircuts. Uh, but in many ways, they were completely approachable, too. I mean, I was so basic. I was just a pleasant kid in a solid color shirt, no weirdness, no odd hair, no earring, nothing. Just a kid from the suburbs who liked computers. And somehow, because we all used this one Apple in the corner with a 10 megabyte disk drive, we all just got famously along. 
When I moved from New York to Boston, and I was a college student, and then later a layabout not college student, and then even further later a layabout not college student, sort of a corporate guy, I went to a lot of user meetings associated with bulletin board systems and with internet sites. Uh, for the bulletin board system meets, uh, we often met at various malls or places of business, and we would all uh, kind of fall into it. It was part of being online still. Even to this day, there is a once-a-year barbecue that I attend. It's not something where we all get down and talk about some vital subject. It is literally a bunch of old friends seeing how things are going talking to folks they might not get an opportunity to talk to, listening to some pleasant music, having some unbelievably great barbecue, and just augmenting our online lives with a little bit of this natural offline experience. So throughout the Bolton Board System documentary, I was filming people who would talk about different BBS meets they went to. And I'll just give you the weirdest one I got. Let's just go right down to the weirdest story told to me, which was there was a bulletin board system in Texas. And this bulletin board system was run by an ex-con. Now, he wasn't doing anything untoward on this BBS. You can be assured of that. But he was somebody who had been through the prison system and had built up kind of ideas of what loyalty and community meant. So if you went to his bulletin board system and you applied to join, he had kind of a rule, which was you had to head out to his compound during one of his meets and go through a series of trials, uh, physical trials, <laughs> physical trials, physical trials, I'm going to say that again, for a bulletin board system, just to show that you were loyal enough that you would be a part of this bulletin board system community, you would take it seriously, and you would be a good citizen within it. Uh, so it was this experience that I don't think many other people had with their bulletin board systems. But I can tell that people might trust each other a little bit more on that bulletin board system because they all remember running through the tires and doing the push-ups out at the compound. And the strangest interaction I ever had uh, at one of these meets uh, was something that's kind of stuck with me for the 20 years since it's happened. Uh, it was around the early 1990s, and this was related to a 2600 meeting. It was basically meet at the mall on the first Friday of the month. This still goes on. And a bunch of people would show up and, and chat. And so a new person showed up. I remember her as being this shorter woman with black hair. Uh, she had a lot of makeup, and she was talking to people a little bit. And at some point she cornered me and she said, so what do you all do? And I was like, well, what do you mean? I mean, like we use, com she's like, yeah, you use computers. I get it. But uh, like, what are you doing? What are you achieving? What are you making happen? And I was like, well, I don't know really what you mean. Um, and she said, well, look at this. And she had some photos with her. And one of them struck me. It was a photo of her with her uh, feet in some sort of box, and she was bound up in some sort of garbage bag with rope around her, and she was on a park bench, and somebody had taken some photos of her, and next to her was somebody reading some sort of paper. And she explained to me that she had had herself put on this park bench, and then they photographed how regular people uh, were interacting with this living art installation. And she's like, I'm, I'm making people question things. I'm making people think. You know, are you people making anyone think? Is this thing of any meaning? What are you doing to change society? And I was fundamentally unequipped to give her any satisfactory answer. But in the years hence, I've thought, you know, in some ways, she's kind of right. You know, it's so easy in social situations and living your life to fall into the same rut.
you know, see the same 10 or 15 people and, and ask how everything is going. And everyone says, oh, it's going good. I'm feeling good. Oh, we just had another kid. Oh, I just bought this new computer. Oh, I got a new car. You know, just kind of living life. But uh, we might really benefit from jumping out of that rut and trying something weird and new, you know, learning a new language or traveling to a place we haven't been before or reading about some experience that's going on, maybe even local to you and and just going to it without a sense of irony, without a sense of making fun of it, but just saying, hey, I think I'll just go and feel out what the experience is. And then if the resulting experience is deep and meaningful, or even a pleasant surprise, or even a great story, bringing that back to your social group to say, this happened, and I had a lot of fun. What have you all done? What are you doing? So huge thanks to a person who decades ago kind of pushed me from falling in to a loop of time that I, I don't know if I would have escaped as soon as I did. You've been listening to Jason Scott Talks His Way Out of It, uh, technology stories and Jason just remembering things a little too clearly. Thanks to James Bequianu, Sam Johnston, Stefan Arens, Astrid Smith, and the hundreds of and the hundreds of other Patreon supporters who've helped me get to where I am. This is the 11th podcast uh, episode that I've done outside of the prototype, and it's something that I'm getting better at, I like to think, and I hope that I'm getting better at it, and I hope that it's something that comes easier and easier as time goes on, but there's always a chance it's going to get harder and harder. Uh, you know, I've, I was collecting podcasts in the early 2000s because I recognized that it was this unique experience for a self-service anthropological experiment. People were recording their own experiences and outlooks and then putting them online for easy access. And I would notice as I started to archive and grab hundreds of episodes that after about two or three months of it, people would move away. Uh, people actually have a term for this, pod fading, but that's really too constricting because I think this affects every regular project. You know, you, you go in with the first thrush of love and passion and you want to talk about things and get involved. And then over time, it becomes possibly a burden to remember that some portion of your week or your month needs this activity and you start to find excuses. Now, in my case, I have the drive of digging myself out of debt. That's going to keep me going for a while. Uh, but over time, we'll see how easy or difficult it is for me to put this podcast together and whether or not I will run out of subjects or I will start to get repetitive or whether I will say the same things over and over again or whether or not I'll be redundant. But I don't think it's going to happen anytime soon. And I really appreciate your feedback on different episodes and subjects. I read everything people write to me. I try to incorporate their suggestions. And I also really try to learn more about the subjects I talk about as time goes on. You know, being forced to make a little speech about a subject that means something to me gets me to research all sorts of related materials that I have built up, but maybe I've never drawn a white line between them. To that end, the podcast's Patreon has added another goal. Uh, if I hit this goal, uh, you can see it at patreon.com slash text files. I will make sure that there is a link dump after every episode. And I'll even go back to my previous episodes and make link dumps for them. So if I discussed OSINI or if I discussed a user meet, I'll link to the text files uh, that are part of that story. So spread the word, get involved, be a part of it. And thank you so much for listening to my podcast.